What's going on Vagabuddies? Buddies and welcome back. Right now we are in Toronto, Canada at Buffer Festival. Last night we screened East of Eden to a live audience at the Elgin Theatre and we're super happy to share our film with you, all of you around the world right now. So we're going to be releasing a behind the scenes of the whole experience of Buffer Festival but what we want to do now that the video is online is give you a little bit of background onto the meaning behind the film because there's a lot going on there. It's uh, definitely a departure from what we've made before. It's a narrative, a short fictional film. So if you haven't watched it, stop what you're doing and watch East of Eden first. But for those of you who have seen it, let's get into the meaning behind the story. This is pretty much like a director's cut. We wanted to sit down with you and have an informal chat about the symbolism behind the film, um, how we did it. First and foremost, we wanted to do something completely different from our normal travel vlogs and our travel tips. And we wanted to try to push ourselves creatively and cinematically to do something that we have never done before. So in order to do that, we reached out to my good friend Carlos Mason, who is a cinematographer. We went to high school together and his good friend Shelby Menzer. And basically, they helped us capture East of Eden in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do on our own. Obviously, we were on motorcycles for almost, almost six days to capture the entire film, but it was kind of like a homage to um, the Eastern Sierra Nevadas and a homage to the place that we grew up, um, but in a way that touches on some of the themes that are affecting uh, the world in 2017. It was really uh, a marriage of two different ideas we had. Alex was really wanting to go do something in the Sierra Nevada. He's also really wanted to do something about motorcycles. We both did. And motorcycles really are a thing that brings both of us together, even when we fight and argue as brothers do. Uh, I personally wanted to do something that was speaking to the division around the world right now and how travel can be a unifying force uh, to combat that division. It can be a bridge between different cultures. We founded Valga Brothers on the premise that travel could create a meaningful conversation between people of different cultures uh, by basically teaching people to appreciate the differences between us. Mm -hmm. That's something that we realized in 2017 uh, is not just important between cultures but within them. Mm -hmm. uh, especially here in the United States where you know there's red states, there's blue states, there's people who are not talking to each other because of politics, especially in down to the familial level between parents and their kids and between brothers and sisters. So we really decided to take our, our idea and try to bring it down to the most personal level. Uh, in, the, in the movie we play fictional brothers, kind of exaggerated versions of ourselves um, that don't talk. And we kind of use the brothers to symbolize America as a whole, which we say in the film it are like uh, family members who, who no longer talk. This is a theme that's happening everywhere across the world, the urban and rural divide and how um, the community within a country is just being drawn further and further apart as cities grow closer and closer together. It feels like the rural areas of many countries are kind of slipping away from their counterparts, their brothers and sisters in the city. So that was one of the themes um, during the film and that's kind of the setup to the next part of the film, which is kind of the first movement, if you will, on the journey like back to nature. That was a really exciting place for us to film. The, uh, the, the second section, the second act is in the Mojave Desert and uh, California, a lot of people, when they think of California, they think of palm trees and beaches. And although a lot of California is that, there's this whole other side to California, east side, east of Eden, if you will. And that's um, that's kind of what we played off of for the titling. And I'll let you take that away because I know that you love John Steinbeck, the author of East of Eden, so please. Yeah, so East of Eden is a book by John Steinbeck. Um, he is California's most famous writer. He was really came into prominence in the 1930s during the Great Depression. East of Eden is a story about two brothers, uh, kind of based loosely on the, on the story of Cain and Abel uh, and the book of Genesis. So the story started there with the idea that when you think of California, people think of this Eden, this coastal Eden, mm -hmm. uh, but there's another side to it. Uh, and so that kind of plays into the idea of people who live in the city, such as the characters, trying to discover 
what else there is beyond what they cons what they usually associate with their home, California. And the desert is such an integral part of what California is, and especially in this part of the Mojave Desert, there's a lot of abandoned kind of ghost towns. There was a mining boom in like the 1800s, and tons of people moved there trying to strike it rich. California has always, you know, it is the golden state, it was really founded on this belief of being able to change your destiny um, and to strike it rich. And so there are tons of these mining towns that kind of boom towns. And uh, when, when the mining dried up, the people moved away, but they left kind of this skeleton of civilization. And um, that was a really interesting kind of, in the, in the film, you, you start in the urban hive, if you will, where everyone's uber connected and you're on your phone, yet isolated, connected yet isolated. Um, part of the city, but feelings of being alone and the transition um, through kind of this skeletal settle settlement, like the bones of civilization, what happens when people move away and, and the cities start to decay. Um, for me, that was like cinematically one of the most interesting parts of the film. I really enjoyed capturing it, even though we were spending multiple days in like 110 degree Fahrenheit heat on our motorcycles, riding around through the desert trying to get to the places to capture those, those moments. The places that we visited in this film are the places that are usually the red part of California. In the last election, they voted for Donald Trump, while the majority of California voted for Hillary Clinton and is more liberal. But to consider California as a monolithic whole is false. There are all types of people within California, and the, the parts of this part of the state is often overlooked. In the United States, people often refer to everything between New York and Los Angeles as the flyover states, which is really unfortunate. Um, so what we were trying to show is that this place, which usually we have sped past on the way to Mammoth Mountain, which is the big ski resort in California, uh, we wanted to really go on motorbike and go slowly and, and go to every single place there and see what the stories are. And the stories that we found in these places are really telling as a whole of the United States. Ransburg, an old mining town which was abandoned. This is kind of uh, a way of nodding towards the economic dislocation that's happening in the Rust Belt of the United States. Old factory towns uh, that have been displaced by globalization and automation uh, and just the general shifting patterns of the economy. These pl this is happening all around the world and you know you can't just ignore that. You have to be able to, uh, if you're living in a part of the world where jobs are prospering uh, and the future looks bright, we felt it was important to go to other parts of the country where that is not such an optimistic future. As we continue to travel north, um, we leave kind of the, the ghost towns and we pass another reminder of uh, the history in our country. During the Second World War, we had um, Japanese American citizens who were American citizens uh, were forcibly relocated from their homes across the United States and put into a um, war internment camp um, in the eastern Sierra of, uh, of California, in this mountain range basically. So Manzanar was a war relocation center where um, American citizens were forcibly removed from their homes and forced to live under guard. Um, it was kind of like an American concentration camp. And uh, so us visiting that and the lines that are spoken uh, during that scene about perspective uh, was a super powerful moment in the film and one that we felt it was necessary to kind of give you all a bit of backstory on so that that scene really resonates the way that we wanted it to resonate. Moving past all these layers of California's history and using California as an analogy for the United States as a whole, um, we feel that one of the most in enduring legacies of the last hundred years is the National Park System, which was basically founded um, from the ideas of a guy named John Muir. He was a Scottish conservationist. He moved to the United States and he fell in love with the Sierra Nevada mountains and Yosemite Valley. And he was kind of the uh, first mover for the 
national park system and the conservationist movement that that saved all of these natural places and places that we as Americans and and the entire world cherish and look at and just look at your Instagram feed how many you know thousands of photos have you seen from Yosemite Valley and from all of the national parks around uh, the United States so going there is, is kind of the moment when we uh, come together as as brothers and as a nation. Our goal with this film was to unify, to try to bridge divides between different communities. Our goal was not to try to tell people how to think or, or what they should believe in. Um, instead, we really wanted to try to just empathize and try to find common ground. If you notice, there's a theme in this film of water. We start off, we essentially trace the Los Angeles aqueduct from the city to the mountains where the water comes from. And the climactic moment, moment is us going into a lake, but before that we go by California City, which is uh, was a really idealistic de development in the 1960s that was supposed to be a city as large as Los Angeles to rival it in size. It is actually the third largest city in, in California by space, but it's abandoned. And it's now this desert, and it shows what happens if we didn't have water. But this water ultimately comes from the communities we were visiting. It comes from the Owens Valley. And, uh, it, and that was kind of our way of showing how uh, cities are inherently dependent on the rural areas that surround them. They don't exist in isolation. So it was kind of a way of trying to show the characters being humbled by their dependency on their neighbors uh, and kind of having a thread to to go through all the different parts of California leading to the climactic moment uh, of a, a sort of baptism, of a spiritual renewal by, by washing yourself in these waters as you would in a religious ceremony because uh, as John Muir has said, as many American uh, philosophers over the years have said, nature is the sacred religion of the United States. It is mountains, rivers, uh, forests that are our cathedrals, are our, our, our chapels, are our, it's where we go to be one with the universe. And that's a thread that you hear from Henry David Thoreau to Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Muir, and that is kind of what we were trying to provide as a solution. Not that you should think this way or you should think that way, but just trying to find something that people in rural communities and urban settings could come together around, which is this idea that nature is our special place. Nature is sacred. It's the undertone of conservationism uh, that we believe in, something that we hold very dearly, and, and something that I think is, is universal. There's the line in the film that says, like, eventually we all must come down from the mountain. And taking that perspective that uh, we've gained through this journey um, back with us into the city, and, and um, trying to integrate that into our lives and uh, and to remember that you know we don't exist in isolation that we're dependent on each other and that at the end of the day we are brothers and sisters regardless of um, our beliefs or our viewpoints and uh, and that's kind of the takeaway from East of Eden so the whole process of pre-production of production and post-production on East of Eden has been a huge learning curve. It's been super enlightening. It's been challenging. It's been fun. It's been uh, it's been a journey, just like the film was a journey. And we're so grateful to be able to a do it with friends. So thank you, Carlos Mason. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Ariana. All of the people. Thank you, Carrie Rad and our aunt Jean. Everyone who helped make this film a reality and help us tell stories in a new way. Um, I just want to say thank you all for, for the support. And thank you to Buffer Festival for giving us the impetus to make this video. A great thing about Film Fest is that although it's not competitive in nature, it is something that pushes you to try to make something that looks good on the big screen. That is really something that we've never done before. It was a step towards us becoming more of a professional production team and something that we're hoping to carry with us forward as we continue to up the ante on our production level. So if you've never been to Buffer Festival before, it's extremely fun. I highly encourage you to come here next year. Hopefully we'll be premiering something else awesome next year in Toronto. So let us know your thoughts in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed the film, please go give those big thumbs up, share them with all of your friends. And in the meantime, stay curious, keep exploring, and we'll see you next year at Buffer Festival. Peace. Peace.